to Nationwide on the network service of the NTA. I am Lydia Odidiochi. We thank you for joining us and Eid Mubarak. As the Eid al Fitri celebrations entered the second day, the FCT community has pledged their unflinching support to President Muhammad Buhari as he strives to implement the next level agenda for sustainable development of the country. This was when members of the community paid homage on the president as part of activities marking the Eid al-Fitri celebration. State House correspondent Adam Usambo reports that President Buhari once again reassured Nigerians that under his watch, the country can only be stronger, more prosperous and enviable. The FCT community comprising amongst others traditional rulers, religious and political leaders, as well as judicial and security officers was led to the State House by the Permanent Secretary, Mr. Christian Chinyaka Oha. He told the President that in the last four years, the FCT has benefited immensely from his wise, divine and inspired leadership, thereby enjoying peace and reaping tremendous benefits of the various social intervention programs. As we steer our country back to the path of social harmony, security, and economic recovery, the people of FCT stand solidly behind you as you begin this task and pledge our support and cooperation in coming years ahead. Mr. Oha said FCT community will continue to play crucial roles towards ensuring that the president succeeds beginning with the planned celebrations of the nation's democracy day on june 12 saying already effective mobilization have been carried out and the residents are prepared to become exceptional hosts of the event vice president emi oshibaju who led senior government officials on the Salah homage said despite the negative and opposing forces against the government and the country nigeria under the buhari presidency is at the threshold of achieving the desired greatness. Our country is destined for greatness, and I know that the Almighty God will lead us to that greatness. So I really want to urge all of our leaders who are here, religious leaders and political leaders, that we must not allow the rhetoric of division to supersede the rhetoric of unity. We must also speak up we must speak in ways that unite our country. If we allow these negative statements to continue, then they will define our country. President Muhammad Buhari is thankful to Allah that his mission and vision for Nigeria, as well as his genuine passion for the nation's greatness, is fully understood and appreciated by Nigerians. This, he said, was remarkably demonstrated in the way and manner they re-elected him for a second term of office. President Buhari therefore promised to do whatever it takes within the limits of the law towards decisively addressing genuine public concerns for peace, unity, stability, corrupt, free, and prosperous Nigeria. I thank you very much, those of you who suffered quietly supporting me, and I assure you that I will continue to do my best. Giant commemorative cards were presented to the Nigerian leader by the FCT residents and the Christian community in the State House as all those present received a presidential handshake. From the State House, Adam Sambu, NTA News. In the same vein, Nigerian women also paid Salah homage on the president at the presidential villa Abuja where the president expressed confidence in the genuine commitment of Nigerian women as nation builders towards safeguarding the country's democracy all along, promising to accommodate more women in the current political dispensation. Set House correspondent Aliu Kabir has that. In the spirit of Idil Fitri's celebration, the representatives of the Nigerian women have converged on presidential villa to pay a salah homage to President Muhammad Buhari, expressing their gratitude to God for witnessing the end of Ramadan fast with optimism of making the best use of the lessons learned during the period. 
While praying for the successful tenure of the present administration, the women promised to remain steadfast in adding value to the government business towards the development of the country. I've taken the lead to say that and to speak on behalf of Nigerian women, that we know you have us at the back of your heart. And you know we have women that are capable, women that have the potentials, and women that will also add value to your administration. We are here to thank God for your good health and to continuously pray that God will continue to increase good health to you day and night. Mm -hmm. We are here again to acknowledge and to reassure you that Nigerian women love you. We've made a promise. We'll fulfill our promise. We are waiting for you to fulfill your own part, Mr. President. <laughs> I will assist standing with you prayerfully so that God Almighty will lead the way and you will succeed in these four years with sound health, with long life, and every idea that will take Nigeria to the next level with women this time around. The few women you have included in your cabinet have proven to be worthy. So we want to assure you that if you do that this time, you're going to leave a legacy, sir. And I'm here speaking on behalf of the civil servants to assure you, Your Excellency, that this time as we move to the next level with you, we will definitely make you very proud. Thank you, sir. Thank you for what God is using you to restore our economy once again. You've seen your vision, what you want to do uh, for Nigeria. And that is why the women resolved that this time the night assembly, since I'm a four-time member of House of Representatives, that we want to be speaker, want to speak on your behalf. President Buhari assured them of more recognition in the appointment this time, taking into consideration the role women played in the last dispensation Cite an example with the former Minister of Finance and the Head of Service of the Federation. Uh, I, I think uh, the biggest trust any leader should, will, show, will show whether it's a household, a town or a country, is to give the treasury to the women. Yeah. <laughs> Since I came, the women are in charge of the treasury. Yes. So I don't think, it's not the number of uh, workers uh, employed. But the fundamentals of who holds the bag, who holds the cash. <laughs> uh, look at the treasury and look at the civil service. <laughs> and it over them to women and you are still asking for more. <laughs> okay, the history of Oliver Twist. Okay, we'll watch it, the numbers. Okay. Thank you very much. The president urged them to sustain the temple in their commitment of maintaining a healthy, and positive family life, which he said is an engine towards a prosperous nation. From the State House, Ali Kabir, NTA News. Nigeria's permanent representative to the UN, Professor Tijani Mohamed Bandi, has described his election as the 74th president of the United Nations General Assembly, PGA, as not only a great achievement to Nigeria in particular, but also to the African continent in general. Let's get details of the election process from correspondent Joy Osiago in New York, as she reports that Professor Bande is the second Nigerian to be elected as the president of the United Nations General Assembly, 30 years after General Joe Garba. A resounding applause for Professor Tijani Muhammad Bande as he is elected to take over the mantle of leadership of the upcoming 74th United Nations General Assembly in September. Professor Bande was elected by acclamation. Declaro al excelentísimo señor Tijani Muhammad Bande de Nigeria elegido por aclamación presidente de la Asamblea General en su 74 periodo de the implementation of existing mandates and the 2030 agenda with particular focus on peace and security, poverty eradication, zero hunger, quality education, climate action and inclusion will constitute the major priority of my presidency. As the United Nations has not met the expectations of its founding fathers in terms of preventing many violent conflicts and mass atrocities, we have to assume collective responsibility to make the world a better, safer, and more peaceful one. And as a Nigerian, as a, and an African, 
You have invaluable insights into the continent's challenges, such as the Sahel and the Lake Chad Basin, and more broadly, into the challenges our world faces across the three pillars of our work, peace, sustainable development and human rights. The delegation from Nigeria and many Nigerian diplomats and some of their colleagues at the United Nations were at the General Assembly Hall to celebrate Nigeria and Africa. This candidate represents not only just the ECOWAS that has endorsed him, but also the Africa, African Union and then the continent as a whole that endorsed him. But also it tells you about the clouds, the experience, uh, uh, the knowledge that the candidate himself uh, 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 is going to bring uh, to bear in the work. And uh, you have heard the testimonies of all the uh, representatives of the regions, including even the United States of America, that this candidate is, uh, is the perfect choice and, uh, uh, and he is bringing a lot of... Uh, of, of knowledge and experience to do. So we are happy that this has taken place at this moment. It's a very important day for Nigeria. When you consider that uh, this is happening with our international relations about 30 years after it first happened with the late General Joseph Garba. So the support for it, the enthusiasm for it at the highest level of government you know, cannot be majored. From the United Nations headquarters in New York, Joy Osiago, NT News. Our next set of reports concern security. Chief of Army Staff, Lieutenant General Tukur Yusuf Burate, has restated commitment of the Nigerian Army to enhancing welfare of its officers and men for effective counterinsurgency operations. This formed part of message delivered on his behalf by the Chief of Logistics Army, Major General Inabong Okun, at a Sala launch on the front line with the troops of 22 Armored Brigade Dikwa in Borno State. Jesse Tafida reports. We apologize for the lack of audio on that report. Moving on now, the Zamfara state government has appealed to the Nigerian army for the deployment of more troops to identify black spots in the state. The state governor, Bello Mohammed, made the appeal when he received the representative of the chief of army staff, Lieutenant General Tukubrate, on operational visit. Defense correspondent Ismail Musa has that one. Visit like this to troops locations in Zamfara state during festivity is a moral booster. After the two Rakat prayers, the guest delivered the chief of army staff message to troops of one brigade, urging them to be proactive and offensive in dealing with bandits and kidnappers that have truncated socioeconomic activities in parts of the state. So no foreigner will like us more than we like ourselves. We must be ready to do the needful to finish with these bandits and criminals that are preventing our people from their living their normal life. While receiving the army chief in Zamfara State Government House, the state governor, Mohammed Bello, promised to complete the ongoing barracks project within the next 100 days and provide the needed logistics to support army's operations in the state. We have a major problem in between um, uh, Wurbenburi to Faru, up to Tarata Mofara. It's a brand new road that is unaccessible road for now because Bandit has already, already taken over that area. The representative of the Chief of Army Staff had lunch with troops from Gusau, Zamfara State, Ismail Musa, NTA News. Still on security, every society needs strong and effective policing to ensure peaceful coexistence and efficient crime control. In view of this, the Cross River State Government has reaffirmed its commitment to synergize with the Nigeria Police Force to keep crime rate in the country at its lowest level. Governor Ben Ayade stated this while playing host to the Assistant Inspector General AIG of Police Zone 6, Musa Kimo, in Calabar. Udwak Etem has details. For Cross River State to maintain its status as safest and most peaceful in Nigeria, 
It requires the cooperation of the police force and state governments in the maintenance of peace and security. In respect to some communal crises experienced in parts of the state in recent times, the police was commended for quick response, even as the state government promised continuous support for the force to ensure effective policing. We are committed to ensuring that there is peace and security, and as crossover statistics shows, it represents 1.1% of total crime in Nigeria. That brings us to the least in terms of crime in this country. The police force, during its visit to government house, Calabar, disclosed the existence of a crime prevention detection and control strategy proven to be successful in most states of the Federation. All the commands under my watch have launched this operation. Um, it is a renounces of intelligence-driven policy. The visit was an opportunity for the police force to seek better collaboration with the Cross River State Government in ensuring that crime rate is reduced in the state and Nigeria for a better country. In Calabar, Uduak Etam, NTA News. We're back to more reports on the Salah celebrations. Governor Belum Mohammed of Zamfara State says his administration has developed a strategy for improving the welfare of orphans and other categories of the less privileged in the state. The governor stated this while hosting a dinner for orphans as part of the ongoing Eid al-Fitr celebration. Jamilu Ibrahim has more. Sharing with the poor and the needy is one of the vital lessons of the Ramadan that ought to be upheld by the Muslims. It is in this spirit that Zamfara State Governor Bello Muhammad organized a special get-together with the inmates of Gusau Orphanage Hope as part of the ongoing Eid al-Fitr celebration. The governor, his deputy, and some other top government officials wined and dined along with the orphans in order to give them a sense of belonging in this festive season. <laughs> Governor Bello, who presented 10,000 Naira cash as a salah gift to each of the 100 orphans in attendance, reiterated his administration's commitment to improving the welfare of all categories of the less privileged in the state. The orphans and their caregivers are full of gratitude to the governor for the honor done to them and prayed Allah to reward him abundantly. Thank you, Gonu. We are very happy. He has demonstrated his commitment and he has shown the concern to the opens. The first thing we want him to do is to construct what we call grown up uh, children home so that uh, those that are above 18 years, the males opens can be separated. Well, this honor done to the orphans by the governor did not come as a surprise to many considering the fact that the Gusau Open Age Home was his first point of call shortly after he was sworn in, where he pledged to sacrifice half of his monthly salary to secure the future of the orphans in Gusau, Jamilu Ibrahim, NTA News. Many thanks, Jamilu. And still in the spirit of the Eid al-Fitri, wife of the President Aisha Muhammad Buhari has put smiles on the faces of some Nigerians in Kano State with the distribution of food items and other essential commodities to the Muslim communities at various mosques in Kano. She urged the Muslim Ummah to use the lessons of Ramadan of perseverance, discipline, obedience, and the fear of Allah to reflect in their daily activities for peace, tolerance and the unity of the country. Mrs. Buhari stated this in a message through the special assistant to the president on administration, Malam Hadi Uba. Said House correspondent Aliu Kabi reports that the gesture is part of the humanitarian activities of Mrs. Buhari in assisting the needy and other less privileged in the society to cushion the effect of their hardship. The distribution of the rice is an annual event embarked by the Aisha Muhammad Buhari Foundation during the months of Ramadan to enable the Muslim Ummah perform the Ramadan fast and Salah celebration with ease. The beneficiaries expressed their happiness with the gesture. 
And a report from Yobe State indicates that this year's Eid prayers were observed in peaceful atmosphere with Governor May Malabuni among hundreds of faithful who worshipped at the Yobe Mosque and Islamic Center Eid Ground in Damaturu, the state capital. Mustafa Yusuf Musa has details. As it was with previous years, this year's Eid prayers were not different as restriction of vehicular movement within and around the state meant people have to trek long distances to eat grounds. The two rakat prayer at the Yobe Mosque and Islamic Center in Tematru was led by Chief Imam of the state, Ustaz Hudu Muhammad Yusuf, with Governor May Malabuni observing his maiden eat as governor of Yobe State at the ground. In a statewide broadcast, Governor May Malabuni reminded people of the state that his administration will commence implementation of plan programs and policies of continuing from where the immediate past government has stopped and consolidated on them. I wish to stress that we will not relent in taking necessary steps towards consolidating the achievements recorded in the state so far. I therefore urge all our good people to rally around our new administration, giving us every support, cooperation, worthy advice and suggestions as part of their contributions for the advancement of our beloved states. Elsewhere across the state, the Eid prayers were conducted in peaceful atmosphere, with thousands of faithfuls trooping out to various Eid grounds to mark the end of the fast in the month of Holy Month of Ramadan. In Dematru, I am Mustafa Yusuf Musa, NT News. Muslim faithful in Gombe State have joined their counterparts worldwide to mark this year's Eid al Fitri. Correspondent Emmanuel Akila reports that Governor Mohamedou Inoua Yahya is among the worshippers. The congregational Eid prayers mark the end of the Ramadan fast. <laughs> Malam Ali Hamari led the worshippers in the two record Eid prayers with Governor Mohamed Inoua Yahya participating as the executive governor of Gombe State for the first time. Imam Ali Hamari who read verses of the glorious Quran, admonished Muslims not to forget the lessons of the Ramadan, but imbibe them in their everyday life affairs, charging all faithful to observe the six days fasting in the month of Shawwal. Special prayers were offered for the problems of armed banditry, kidnapping and insurgency in some part of the country to come to an end. Governor Inoue Haya hosted the people at government house for a lunch, where he gave a salah message calling for peaceful celebrations. The palace of the Emir of Gumbi, Al-Haj Abubakar Shehu Abubakar III was the next center of attraction where the governor, his deputy, and top government functionaries pay Salah homage on the Emir. After the Emir's message to the people, the horse riders took the arena and in their colors took turns to entertain the guests. <laughs> the celebrations continue with visitations to relations, friends and well-wishers in Gombe. Emmanuel Akila, NTA News. Lagos is our first port of call on Nationwide, and here is Ruth with the very latest from that zone. Hello, Ruth. Baraka de Sala. Baraka de Sala to you too, Lydia, and welcome to the Center of Excellence. Lagos State Governor Babajide Sanwolu has handed over 35 brand new buses to civil servants for transport. Nosa Osla reports that the head of service, Hakim Murio Kuola, inaugurated the new buses and thanked the governor for catering to the welfare of workers. Traffic management and transportation. The governor had on resumption of office promised to reflect the central bus system, the body handling transport for civil servants, as almost all buses being used to transport them were dilapidated. Four days after the promise, Governor Songo Olu handed over the buses to the CBS. The head of service stated that the governor made good his promise by reflecting the entire CBS, adding that it was now a clarion call on civil servants to rededicate themselves to qualitative service delivery. The conditions of our buses uh, as a trailblazing state was nothing to write home about. It was very embarrassing, the internal conditions of the buses, the, the manner in which uh, we made our public servants to endure and endure discomfort 
in getting to their workplace. And you would agree with me that if the mind that is coming to work is uncomfortable, the body is uncomfortable, then the output can never be optimal. Murio Kola added that the CBS drivers would have to undergo training to be able to drive the new buses as they were technical to operate than other buses. In Lagos, Nosa, Usula, NTA News. Pharmacists in Nigeria are appealing to President Muhammad Buhari to speedily sign into law the Pharmacy Council of Nigeria bill to strengthen action against drug abuse in the country. This was at a forum in Lagos to draw attention to the devastating effects of drug and substance misuse. Joy Ken Abapoya has details. Drug and substance abuse, a self-destructive indulgence that leads to significant problems, has taken a different dimension, especially among youths. The United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime 2018 report reveals that 10.6 million people use cannabis in Nigeria. 4.6 abuse pharmaceutical opioids, while 238,000 are amphetamine users. One of every four abusers is a female, while teenagers are also said to be neck deep in substance abuse. This disturbing situation is why pharmacists under the Drug and Substance Abuse Committee of the Nigeria Academy of Pharmacy are gathered. And the trouble with drug is that, yes, it does that thing that you want it to do. It makes you feel good, it makes you feel high, but in the it damage your system. This opioid is why it looks relatively easy to abuse is because you can get them legally from any pharmacy for various reasons. For particularly antibiotics, you know, we need strict prescription, which is not what is happening in Nigeria here. Some of the factors leading to drug and substance abuse have been identified as socioeconomic and socio-psychological. These factors also have negative impact on productivity. To fight this drug war, the committee is calling on the federal government to strengthen relevant agencies to control misuse. Regulate the access to medicines so that those who do not who see medicines as merely items of commerce and commodities for sale will not have access. Pharmacies today have a directive that if anybody comes to their shop to buy medicine, they must know why he's buying it. We want to passionately appeal to His Excellency, uh, the, uh, the President, to kindly sign the Pharmacies Council, uh, Pharmacies Council of Nigeria bill into law, because that is to give a more effective control of some of the orthodox drugs, uh, drugs and the drugs that affect the central nervous system that ordinarily should be under strict control in this nation. Continuous sensitization through sustainable approach to curbing the menace, these pharmacists say, will help in eliminating the scourge of substance abuse in the society. In Lagos, Joy Ken Abakpoya, NTA News. Some human rights activists have restated the need for the federal government to immortalize the late wife of MKO Abiola Kudirat in recognition of her struggle for democracy in Nigeria. They stated this during the commemoration of the 23rd anniversary of Kudirat Abiola at her gravesite in Lagos. Ken Igbeluge reports. The 23rd anniversary of the death of late Kudirat Abiola provided opportunity to extol the virtues and what she stood for. Those who spoke described Kudirat Abiola as a symbol of voice and strength of the Nigerian women. They eulogized her as a mother of the struggle for democracy who displayed uncommon courage and doggedness. We want to use today to remind everyone that Kudirat Abiola should be immortalized through a national monument. We thank the federal government. June 10, she'll be inducted into the Women Hall of Fame with the designation matter, matter of Nigerian democracy. President Muhammadu Buhari can show that Nigeria values women in Nigeria as much as South Africa, as much as Ethiopia, by announcing 50% of the positions to women. And we need to do whatever we can, including ad adopting affirmative action as a, a legislation in our, in our National Assembly, so that women can also be at least 30% of positions in elective office. It's important to um, 
to bring to bring a light to what she was able to accomplish in her time. And you know, for me, it's she's my mom, so I want to do it because I actually believed in what she stood for. And it's uh, it's also um, something about history. Not letting our, 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 the future of our nation make those same mistakes is one of the reasons why I have been pushing this. And Late Kudirat Abiola was the wife of the acclaimed winner of the June 12 presidential election, Chief MQ Abiola. She was assassinated on Tuesday, June 4, 1996, along the Lagos Ibadan Expressway in Lagos. Ken Igbeluge, NTA News. That's our contribution from Lagos. Nationwide continues after this break. Stay with us. Thanks for staying. Nationwide continues in Abuja. It is already 20 years of unbroken democracy in Nigeria, and the future is becoming brighter by the day for that desired leadership and good governance. Guests on Tuesday Live were of the view that though there are still lots to do, but the present administration is already laying the right foundation that will make Nigeria's democracy an envy in the League of Nations, doing dear reports. Since the attainment of independence in 1960, Nigeria have had to take charge of its own administration through a direct rule. This quest has not been without some ups and downs as the nation's democracy was often thwarted by the military rule. It's 59 years of independence and Nigeria being in its fourth republic has enjoyed an unbroken civil governance. Guests on Tuesday Life critically extrays the trend of leadership since the country's independence with special consideration on the level of development, all of which are inched on government policies and social interventions as well as infrastructural development. So any country that is able to establish this foundational work is definitely on the path of honor. And we can boldly, like you asked the question, say that we are indeed moving in a positive direction. Uh, we are going to be looking at Nigeria, a, a, a higher Nigeria that looks like those days when things were, we, we were free, we could move around, free everybody is everybody's brother. You are from the east, you are from the north, you are from anywhere, you, everybody is together. With the recent swearing in of President Muhammad Buhari for his second term in office, guests on the show express optimism that Nigerians will fully enjoy the dividends of democracy. In terms of bridging infrastructural deficits, what we started in terms of provision of jobs, what we started in terms of the economy, which is the Economic Re Recovery and Growth Plan, and all of, the, all of this will be scaled up at the next level. In Abuja, doing dear and the news. 20 years of uninterrupted democracy in Nigeria has led to an increased citizens' participation that needs to be translated to good governance. More guests have been speaking on Nigeria's democratic experience in the last 20 years. On NTS Good Morning Nigeria, Alika Kwanachiarua has more. It has been 20 years since the military returned to the barracks, allowing democracy to take roof in the country. Guests on Good Morning Nigeria noted that there have been some achievements, but more needs to be done to ensure that Nigerians enjoy the dividends of democracy, which include access to basic education, health, water, and sanitation, among others, which remains the major challenge. As a nation and as a country, uh, it is 20 years down now. We must sit down and look at how do we fashion our own democratic process in line with our own culture and belief. And so also, how do we fashion our economic uh, blueprint or economic process according to our own culture and belief? If, if we are to practice physical federalism and then, it, uh, and then fight our, the big elephant in the room, which is corruption. Uh, the cost of running gov the big government, cost of government is uh, gov and governance is very high, and everybody doing their bit. Then we are going to have a better government. They also stress the need for a holistic review and enhancement of the democratic processes to ensure inclusiveness, especially women participation in governance. I think we need to look at the constitution again, see how we can reduce the powers of states and allow local governments, you know, to 
um, also have some powers to independently uh, play roles which would um, help um, citizens at that level of government um, to, to benefit in, in, you know, from um, services and from the resources which are nationally generated and um, devolve uh, to that level of government. The strengthening of democratic institutions, transparency and accountability were also emphasized as necessary ingredients to democratic growth in Abuja. Alika Okwanachi Arua, NTN News. Imo State Governor Emeka Ehedioha has read riot act to those in possession of government properties and funds. He said that this while declaring open a three-day retreat for elected legislation of the State Ninth Assembly. Sele Osayande reports. Governor Assistant Legislator used the forum to educate the lawmakers on what proper legislation entails. He told the legislators that his administration will not be run on propaganda. Governor Ihedioha, who denounced the proliferation of autonomous communities in the state, but the past administration advised communities still angling for autonomy to share their ambition. The government drives you. So when you are living, government says, okay, we should give you a car to carry you so that you don't begin to stand on the road because of the position you are occupied. But you don't just come and say, ah. I am taking. You have to steal it because it does not belong to you. You are not government. I need to be saying these things for you to understand my actions. I will criminalize anybody who, if the person can think is wrong, they can run. They will catch you. Meanwhile, the governor embarked on an inspection of a racial ravaged site, an NDDC abandoned project. He promised to revisit the project to boost economic activities. From Obuta, Selos, and the NTA News. It's time to join Felicia in our Just Network Center for more stories. Hello, Felicia. Lydia, welcome to Joss. The Eid al Fitr celebration in Plateau State has been generally peaceful with accolades on government and security agencies for a hitch free celebration by Joss residents. Kim Gotts has a situation report as he visited business areas and some major streets in Joss Metropolis. Amadi Bellaway and Terminus area. Business nerve of Joss are relatively busy as business activities are yet to gather full momentum. This, to a large extent, is attributed to the peaceful Edil Fitri Salla celebration witnessing the state. With the celebration on its second day and no report yet of any security breaches, it is the prayers of residents of Joss that this should be a continuous one. Today is the second day of Salla celebration. Yesterday was peaceful and we wish that today will also be the same thing and subsequent days will also, you know, experience the same thing. We thank the security agencies that are operating in Plateau State, more especially the Special Tax Force, Operation Safe Heaven, and the Commissioner of Police and the other security agencies. The security situation is very fantastic. We appreciate the effort of the governor and the security situation in general. With the inauguration of President Mohamed Buhari into office for a second term, they appeal for more proactive measures that will guarantee the security of lives and property in the country. In Jaws, Kim Gotts, NT News. Which occurred at Rico's. We apologize for that mix-up. Moving on now. We now take a second break. Do stand by for more reports afterwards. Welcome back. Governor Tambuel pays a sala homage on the Sultan. Details of this and more with Asmao in Sakwetu. Thank you, Lydia. Good afternoon and welcome to Sokoto. President General Supreme Council for Islamic Affairs Sultan of Sokoto, Muhammad Saad Abubakar, has challenged elected government officials to concentrate on ensuring good governance and avoid political intimidations. Delato Abdullahi reports that the Sultan was speaking when Governor Amin Waziri Tumbul paid him traditional salah homage at his palace. 
It is a long tradition that the state governor pays homage on the sultan at his palace. While acknowledging the sustained support and prayers his administration is enjoying from the Sultanate, Governor Amin Wazire Tambual pledged to complete all ongoing projects and initiate new ones. He called on the people of the state to support and cooperate with security operatives in their effort to squarely address the activities of bandits and other criminal activities in the state. Sultan of Sokoto Muhammad Sa'ad Abakar described life on earth as a temporary journey and challenged Muslims to sustain the lessons and the virtues of Ramadan. He also challenged leaders to re-strategize efforts to tackle security challenges, saying they will continue to partner with the government to achieve success. The Sultan urged leaders to provide job opportunities for the people, particularly the youth, to check restiveness and called on politicians to stop blackmailing the Sultanate Council and respect its sanctity as a traditional institution. In Sokoto, Dalatu Abdullahi, NTA News. Governor Abubakar Atiku Bagudu has described traditional rulers as the pillars of political unity enjoyed in the state. The governor stated this when he received the emirs of the four emirates in the state on a Salah homage. Usman Abdullah Shehu reports. This year's occasion was attended by the emir of Gondu Alhaj Muhammad Elias Subashir, the emir of Argungu Alhaji Ismail Muhammad Mera, the emir of Yaudi Dr. Zayano Abdullahi, and that of Zulu General Muhammad Sani Sami retired as well as the former Minister of Justice, S.A. and Abubakar Malemi, among many other dignitaries in the state. Governor Abubakar Atiku Bagudu recognized the support from the four Emirates, pointed out that it is through their cooperation that the state is able to enjoy atmosphere of the present political unity. The governor similarly commended President Muhammad Buhari for supporting Kebi State Agricultural Pursuit through the Anko Borua program introduced in 2015. Governor Bagudu, however, reiterated commitment to support agriculture for the development of the state. The Emir of Gondu, Al Haji Muhammad Ilyas Ubashar, who led the Emirs, commended President Muhammad Buhari and Governor Bagudu's style of leadership in the country and the state, minded Nigerians of the importance of peaceful coexistence, urging them to do everything humanly possible to ensure the country remain peaceful. In a similar vein, Governor Bagudu described the synergy between the state government and security agency as the key element in the peace and joy in the state. The governor assured that his administration will continue to give all the necessary support towards maintaining peace and security in the state. The governor stated this while receiving the heads of security agencies in the state who paid him a seller homage. In Brennan Kebi, Usman Abdullah Shehu, NTA News. And that's it from Sokoto. The news will continue with Lydia in Abuja. Id Mubarak. Many thanks, Asma'u. Despite the housing deficit declared in Nigeria, there still exists a litany of houses not occupied due to growing affordability challenge in Abuja. It affects and spreads from the very low income earners, low income, to the moderate income households. Omini Oden searches into the parameters for pegging house rent in Abuja, the nation's capital. The central business district of Abuja comes alive during weekdays but looks empty at weekends and during public holidays. Reason being, most residents working in the public and private sectors choose to live in adjoining states of Nasarawa, Niger, Kogi and Kaduna where they can afford rentable apartments. This development has returned rentable apartments, plazas, and sundry structures to the property market, but the affordability challenge remains. So, what parameters are used to determine rents in Abuja? And the other question is, who regulates them? You cannot pay rent. You only put a property in the market at a rent. If there is demand for it, it will go. If there is no demand for it, it will stay. Systems, you know, activities, is not solely in the hands of governments. Um, government is public, but we have the factor of the private sector as well. Government cannot do it alone. For those who can afford, it might be easy in the first instance, but at the expiration of the tenancy, it becomes a huge challenge. For instance, if you look at this environment, you will see, you might see a two-bedroom apartment rented out for a particular amount, 
and the next uh, compound, the next building, will be higher or lower than the other one, and there won't be a much difference. More than half of what they saved goes to the landlords, and they can hardly do anything for themselves. The high-end structures are unoccupied because those who should occupy them cannot afford the cost. The developers, on the other hand, are stuck with it. It does not mean that government has not taken steps to ensure that rents or workers' challenge on rent is assuaged. But there seems to be a ring by our investigation. Is this problem not surmountable? The government should relocate the offices to the satellite towns where the people can afford to pay. Not ignore the aspect of uh, mortgages as well. You know, um, if it is not working, it's, it's a reflex, reflection of uh, some of the larger problems we've always uh, pointed out. We must have a workable mortgage run properly by people who know what it is. With the housing deficit in the neighborhood of 17 million, even when a lot of houses in Abuja are unoccupied due to cost, the way to go is really the solution to this trend. But how soon? In Abuja, Omini Odan, NT News. We now join Comfort in Enugu for more on Nationwide. Yeah, and welcome to Enugu Network Center. Research shows that approximately 7 million people worldwide die prematurely each year from air pollution. As the world marks the 2019 Environment Day, it is a clarion call for governments, industries, communities, and individuals to come together to explore renewable energy and new technologies to improve their, their air quality in cities and regions across the world. Ijoma Ugweke has the details. According to experts, environmental pollution has posed a major challenge worldwide, despite concerns by government and private organizations in that direction. Urbanization and industrialization, as well as economic development, have led to increase in energy consumption and waste discharges. None of the cities in Nigeria has what is called sanitary landfill system, whereby all the waste that are generated by different households and institutional development and uh, multiple agencies are aggregated and catered away to these dump sites where resources can be recycled. But in, what you see is an enlarged dump site whereby you aggregate both degradable and non-degradable waste. The monitoring we have is uh, what we call a compliance uh, concern. It's giving us a very serious concern uh, that the citizens or people residing in Enugu are not complying with the practice that is ongoing. These things enter into the air when they burn um, the wood. And you have a... Um, you know, respiratory issues can this we breathe in this air that is coming from here. And it is harmful over a period of time. As the world marks the Environmental Day 2019 with the theme air pollution, we can't stop breathing, but we can do something about the quality of air we breathe. The day is celebrated annually on 5th June to raise awareness of the environmental issues ranging from the air pollution to global warming and sustainable food production to protection of trees and wildlife. Enugu Ijomu Gweke, NTNU. Next is the weather report for Thursday. Lydia in Abuja. And that's Nationwide. Thank you for watching. I am Lydia Ojije Ochi. Have a pleasant evening and Barkadusallah.